Roll sound. This is the actual clipboard from the film Miracle Mile. Action. That's the best. I don't know how we can ever beat a start to the show for that time, do you? At the end. Steve, thank you for joining us. We've both been looking forward to this for a long time. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for, for wanting me to be on your show. Oh, that's okay. We've got a lot to dig into. Uh, the yeah. first thing I want to do, I'm, I'm always so interested to find out how people got into the business in the first place so what led you into 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 what you do you know i didn't grow up as a movie nut i had no connections as business business i grew up in a little logging town longview washington about 40 miles north of portland and you know my dad was a history teacher and a local you know state senator but i was mainly just a jock i ran track i was a at the state record in the four what's now the 400 meters one lap race and then I went to Occidental College, and the guys down the hall had cameras, and they went to the movies three times. Uh, one of them was uh, Jim Wheat of the Wheat Brothers. They did an Ewok movie. They made a lot of movies. I think they did a wrote Pitch Black. Anyway, all of a sudden, I got the movie bug and, uh, you know, started making Super 8 movies, pix little pixelation things, and... Uh, went to another school after two years and made just continued to make sort of short films. Um, I wish I could have run 400 meters. When I was at school, I used to do one and 200. Anything more than 200 meters, and that was me done. I couldn't do it. So I, I ran the 100 and 200 too, but that was it was a killer race. And, and um, you know, and I kept getting injured in, in college. So, you know, I switched, switched, um, uh, uh, things that I was, you know, obsessed with. And, and for the seventies, I just made films and wanted to be a filmmaker. Finally, by the, um, end of, uh, you know, like 1978, I made a short film noir movie, Tarzana, and mm. that got me into the business. Yeah. Tell me more about Tarzana. I watched that this afternoon and re and really enjoyed it because I'd never seen it before. That was something that passed me by. I'd you know, it, the music just got cleared recently, so I couldn't really run it because I used old Jerry Goldsmith and mm -hmm. Bernard Herman cues from TV shows, which, you know, when you make a student short in the 70s and VHS doesn't even exist yet, you know, nobody thinks about the future of, you know, just go use here, use this kid. And so then we, there was an issue about being able to run it. Well, I went to the AFI in, I think, 1975 when I was four years old. Um Actually, my class at the AFI was interesting. It was John McTiernan, Ed Zwick, and Marshall Herskowitz, Stu Kornfeld, who just passed away, who, who produced The Fly and, and you know, uh, was Ben Stiller's partner, Ron Underwood, who directed City Slickers. I don't know. It was a packed class. But I didn't really get much out of it, and I was there as a writer, so I dropped out, and I made Tarzana, 35 millimeter, black and white, not a cheap little thing, you know, exactly. big film noir, John Alton lighting. We used old BNC, uh, Mitchell cameras and uh, Cook primes and it, you know, and then I cast rather than, you know, your student filmmaker, you go get your friend down the hall and put a fedora on him <laughs> and you sort of fake the film noir thing. I went and got Eddie Constantine from Alphaville, uh, Timothy Carey from the killing and paths of glory the coroner from Chinatown, the madam from Farewell, My Lovely, Edie Adams, the giant from uh, Carl Stryken from Twin Peaks, who was also in my AFI class. That was his first role. Oh, wow. uh, so, um, yeah, so, in a, you know, shot four times over two years, made it for about $12,000. I mean, it, it was killer production. You just mm. kept shooting. But I literally went from being a bus boy um, to being a Hollywood director overnight. It played as sort of the opening band at, at that time, the biggest film festival, Filmex, sort of the equivalent of Sundance today. Uh, everybody in Hollywood had come to see Marty Bress's seven, uh, 70 minute movie, Hot Tomorrows. And we were the opening band that, you know, wowed the crowd. And the next week, 10 agents or more called to represent me, and I had a career. So. That's amazing because it looks beautiful it's got that proper noir look to it the lighting and it. yeah. it's fantastic you know 
35 black and white, most of it in plus X, which is a really slow stock. So it's just silver, just imbued with silver. Um, you know, there's stills up on my website, but and there will be a way to view it. I, I don't know if, if I'm going to do a pay per view or if you, you know, some something, or you can down, you know, but um, it's not really available to watch the whole thing right now. Mm -hmm. But it will. Be what was what was the most difficult thing about putting that together, production wise? Not really having any money and pretending you're <laughs> going to. <laughs> <laughs> If there is, there is, and I don't know if you saw that, there is an outtake of Timothy Carey. Yeah, yeah at the end. Yeah. It, it's its own film. It has its own kind of cult following, which is just that he used up all the film and we shut down and, and you know, <laughs> after three or four days shooting and then had to regroup. It was pretty much my career ended when we ran out of film there and money <laughs> and just kept going for another two years and then, you know, finally got it done. So. It was great to see that at the end, though, because the credits rolled, and I thought, oh, oh. there's a good about 12 minutes left. What's coming on? And then I was just, like, transfixed yeah, to the screen. You know, the close-up version. It's just one shot. Yeah. It's supposed to be, like, a 15-second scene <laughs> before a montage, and it's seven minutes long, and it's un it's just your jaw drops. It does. And, and uh, you know, he we were shooting in the DA of San Pedro's office, not with permission. We were filming the jail scenes and the guard let us in. We're supposed to be out of there. Cleaned up. So it's like five in the morning, the sun's coming up and we've used up all the film and we've set the rug on fire and there's glass and rotting fish traits in there. And, you know, we could have gone to jail, but uh, <laughs> uh, that's what you do when you're a young filmmaker and you, you know, you have to go make your mark. So. Yeah. Anything to get it done, of course. And you were writing as well because then you you did the uh, the screenplay for Strange Brew. I remember watching that on VHS many many years ago when it came out. Yeah, I actually Joel Silver, the producer, put that together. I he sent up. I think I'd written Miracle Mile by then in a logging with helicopters movie for Burt Reynolds that did, never got made. But he's you know he thought there should be a Bob and Doug movie. They're, they did that bit you know Bob and Doug mm -hmm. on MPTV. And so he sent my scripts up there and Belushi had just died and they were very depressed and, and we we're going to be very busy again. So I went up to like concoct something to do as a Bob and Doug movie because um, MGM wanted to do something um, and ended up with Hamlet and a brewery, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern or Hosers, a, eh? and I think I wrote the first draft in 10 days and, oh, wow. um, and I actually got hired to direct it. So, um, but the, it ended up being a Canadian movie, but they paid me $50,000 to not direct it. It was a good job. <laughs> if I really hate something, I'll, I'll take less money to not do it. But that was, I have a, a, a price set for that, but I gave every penny to Warner brothers to buy Miracle Mile, the script back from, from Warner brothers. So it, it worked out. It all worked out yeah. in the end. I was in Canada when strange brew came out over there. And I remember oh, yeah. stuff for it was everywhere. People were really obsessed with it. I mean, I guess I have, you know, three 80s cult movies. I mean, Strange Brew by far has the biggest cult. That's that's huge. Miracle Mile has its own. And then Cherry 2000, my other feature, has, has a cult following as well. And it, you know, none of them were successful <laughs> you know, at the box office. So, uh, and they're all in the MGM library now. So, well, too. Because Cherry Two Thousand, I, I rewatched that again just the other night. That's that's a great film. You know, I'm I used to kind of distance myself from it because it was a tough, it was a really tough movie, and I and I really just wanted to make Miracle Mile. I turned down off off of Tarzan. I turned down tons of movies. Just I really didn't do anything from 1978 till 1985 except turn stuff down. I was attached to things. I was going to do a Hell's Angels movie that I discovered Mickey Rourke for and a few other things. But, um, you know, a D.B. Cooper story, I was scouting locations for that. But, you know, I just wanted to make Miracle Mile, and I jumped on Sherry just in a weird situation where it was going to, Miracle Mile was going to be a $2 million Nick Cage movie right after Valley Girl. If, you know, when you didn't really know who Nick Cage yeah, was. Yeah. It's not like today. <laughs> um, so, uh, 
And but then his his agent and attorney did a big bluff and pulled him out of it. At the same time, they gave me Cherry, and I jumped on Cherry Two Thousand, which was a, a moving train, you know, um, shooting in like ten weeks, which is not you know. So I just jumped on it. Really didn't have that much prep time, and we you know went out in the deserts of Nevada and made a crazy movie with a lot of blowing up of things <laughs> some of the some of the names though when you sat watching that i mean larry larry fishburne before he was lawrence fishburne well that's because you know he I, he was gonna be in he was you know best friends with nick and so uh it was kind of like hey you want to come out to vegas and be in a movie so he you know he was i mean he had done apocalypse now of course when he yeah. was 14 to 17 <laughs> <laughs> believe the kid uh so he just came out to do uh, do a bit and was great of course and Mar marshall bells in that scene i mean the character actors in cherry are, are oh, character incredible. actors the costumes by julie weiss and the music by basil paladoris i think really make the film work you know give it its charm you know but um well, there's a couple of actors in there, and Tom, we've talked about these two these two people so many times. Can you tell us anything about working with Brian James, who we both love? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, he he's he was wonderful. Actually, Tim Thomerson. Oh, that, uh, of you know, the bad, they were in the army together, so they were you know they were in heaven. It was just like they were like old friends, um, and you know couldn't be better. Now. Uh, yeah, and just you know, but I one wonderful in everything they do. And Tim just improvs, you know, he'd you know, he'd do the dialogue, but then he'd do variations. <laughs> how much how much of the improv that Tim did is in the final cut of the movie? Uh you know, I can't remember. I'll have to look at the script sometime, but a lot of those, you know, zingers, you know, he'll say something that needs to be said and then he'll throw he'll always throw a zinger in to, to hit it. Like you know, you know, don't group up uh, one grenade will get you all or you know. <laughs> uh, and just you know, he was a pl a, a pleasure to, to work with. You know, my leads. You know, I don't know if I directed them or I refereed them, but um, <laughs> you know, it, it was it was a difficult shoot. We shot in every toxic location in Nevada, um, and set. You know, we we didn't have prep time, so sets a set wouldn't be ready. You know, so you have storyboards and you have plans to do this but it's not ready. So then you go wing it and you do something else. So it's, you know, even though I've, I've embraced the film and I love the, 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 it's, it's an oddball film. It's, I don't think there's anything really like it. It's just very strange, but I, it's not a film by me, you know, uh, Cotty Chubb who produced it, uh, Michael Amoreda and Lloyd Fonville who did the story and the script. And, and like I said, those other contributors, they're, they're equal to, you know, creating whatever we ended up with um, as I am. I mean, I, I was the director and I contributed a ton, but, you know, it's not a, not a Steve DiGiorno film. <laughs> the end result is great. It's always really enjoyable to, to rewatch it. And where is it with rewatching it again? I wanted to ask you, where is it? You know where the car slides down and it's the, like the big... Oh, well, that's in Hoover Dam outside of Vegas. Ah. That's, yeah. I mean, you could never do that today. I was thinking more. <laughs> uh, that's really in a spillway in Hoover Dam, and it really, even though it looks big on screen, if you ever see it in a theater, it'll show up there. It's it's like six hundred feet. It's an angle like that. I mean, it's really awesome. I mean, I I don't know. So, um, and that's a real stunt person on the back of the Mustang when the magnet that's drops. And one of the most ridiculous. One one of the better uh, RPG fight scenes you'll see, but still, it, it's a ludicrous scene. It's just, we needed some action set piece. So, oh, that worked. That works brilliantly. And a lot of the stuff that you see in this and in Miracle Mile that nowadays would be CG, and he's all and he's yeah. just all practical now. Yeah, I don't know. We had a couple, you know, old glass uh, plates. You know, of putting Vegas in sand dunes. You know where you actually paint it on a piece of glass and then you shoot through it. Mm -hmm. So that's really old school. That's like Citizen Kane, you know, old school. Uh, I don't think there's any CGI. Miracle Mile has, you know, just you know the gas station blows up. That's some stock footage, you know, melded with real footage. And we did have it in the outtakes. There's you can see an actual H bomb that goes up, but um, 
you know, it, it looked bad, so we cut it out. So we, we had a budget of $20,000 for a vaccine. <laughs> well, that's nothing, it really is it at all. <laughs> <laughs> the whole budget was $3 million to actually make the movie, four, four all in. So, you know, and we had to shoot all nights and blow up Los Angeles. It was, <laughs> even then, the completion bond company said, you can't make this for under 20. So it was, it was tough. That's really tough. Just briefly going back to Cherry 2000 that, with another actor that I've got to ask you about. And yeah. and the, the costume he was wearing was very striking. Robert Zadar. It was good to see him oh, as well. Yeah, he, you know, he, he, I guess later he did Maniac Cop and things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, his costume, I mean, Julie Weiss, like I say, was the costume designer, is somebody on the website, or if we ever do more extras for a, a version of Cherry, I have interviews with her. She did Frida and 12 Monkeys and American Beauty, you know, big costume designer. She'd done, the only thing I had directed professionally before this, the Alfred Hitchcock mm. dance pilot, Man from the South, but she just does weird stuff that are, you know, she's in her own universe. She really cares. Um, she, unlike most, you know, costume designers who don't even go to the set, she's on the set dressing some extra who's not even in the shot 200 yards away, just <laughs> and you're holding up the shot. You go, Julie, great, but we got to shoot. So she just cares that much. She's a really amazing artist. But. And you, you just said then about if, you know, you ever get more extras for another version of Cherry that comes out. I mean, Arrow released the great Blu-ray of Miracle Mile. Have you ever been approached for a new Blu-ray release of Cherry 2000 with a load of well, extras uh, on it? Uh, Kino put one out, and we did. There, I did a commentary hmm. on it with uh, Walter Chow, who I did, you know, who wrote a book on Miracle Mile, and I did a commentary on Miracle Mile. Uh, and then they had some, you know, making of the movie thing that I'm barely in because we, we were we had three sets going that day when we were shooting. We were just you know, it was like the last week of shooting and we we're just running around trying to grab everything we could. Um, you know, I'll put I'm building this website which mm. people should definitely check out. Um, just if you just go Steve Dejarnet.net, just my name, D E J A R N A T T run together dot net. Um, you know, I Got a lot of stuff up there. I'll put storyboards of things, and you know, there's about ten percent up now of what's going to be up. This wow! Because sort of wow. I was and, having a look at it today, and it's it's already a good website to have a look around. I did, <laughs> Can I show you the room here? Yeah, of course you can. Love to. <laughs> okay, so you know, this is my place up north of Seattle, and I just got boxes and boxes of stuff. <laughs> it's just taking me forever to scan stuff, but there's like a I think it posted before an alternate opening with Ben uh, Johnson narrating an opening in, in that voice. And there's not a lot of alternate stuff with, with Cherry. You know, I wish there was, and there was, there was other versions to it, but it's, it's pretty much close to what it was at the, the, the earlier cuts. Same thing with Miracle Mile. There's an outtake reel on, on all the Blu-rays, but it's, this is mainly just shots. There's, there's one sequence with Joe Turkel in Miracle Mile that's, cut it's not, it was never actually cut into the rough cut but it's it's in the uh, 10 minute outtake thing of, of nice. blue, all the blue rays, blue rays. But, as you're going uh, through stuff to put onto your website have you found anything yet that you'd forgotten about on your work oh my word I for, i'd totally forgotten about that yeah i just found a, a letter from tom you know thomas pynchon gives permission to make gravity's rainbow cliff notes uh, you know, and Thomas Pynchon doesn't, you know, nobody can find him. But, and Cliff Notes made this for us. They're, they're, you know, they're not really Cliff Notes. They're just fake. But but they actually made this, you know, with a cover. And he had to give his permission. So I, I sort of knew that, but I actually found the legal letter where somebody's saying, yes, Thomas Pynchon gives you permission to do this. So That is brilliant. Think, it makes it all the more interesting. I, mean, I, mean, I got the call sheets. I got the insurance. I mean, I... I'll, I'll have everything up there at some point. If, some, if you really want to study, you know, all the ingredients of a film, it'll be, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, I think here, here's just a rehearsal with the cast. <laughs> is that a good angle? Yeah. 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 You know, this, this is, I mean, I did storyboards for the sequence. Yeah. And then this is, this is rehearsing for quite a bit. And, um, and 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 then film and then taking stills of the rehearsal. Here, here's 
Paul Chadwick did the storyboards, who does Dark Horse Comics now. So, oh, you know, there's beautiful. Oh, uh, yeah. Anyway, it's, yeah, it's hard for me to see what I'm doing on the other side of the screen. And, you know, Paul Chadwick did these nine paintings. Um, oh, yeah. Of yeah. The thing. Whoops, that's upside down. Is it? In the script. <laughs> anyway. And, you know, and we're going to have posters on there uh, that people can acquire cheaply. I'm not trying to make money doing this. In fact, I've been in trouble money-wise because I went to France for a month, and I just I thought I'd, you know, ask for contributions for posters, and I just gave them all away. So, you know, I, I can't go broke or lose money doing this, but but it, it, it's I'm not going to try to generate you know, money doing it. It's just to get stuff to anybody who's a fan of the films. Oh yeah. I mean, for the film fans like me and, and you, Tom, it's, it's, that's just the kind of stuff we, we eat up. It's great to see that kind of stuff. Uh, and then, you know, here, here's it. The original script was an older guy. That was like one of the first concepts, like a Gene Hackman guy going back to get his ex wife. There's been talk about doing a, you know, reboot or reconceptualization, which I hope we are able to do just so I can have a nice payday. I, they have to pay me as a writer and director. Um, but I don't want it to be two people meeting and falling in love. That, the original script was a, you know, reconciliation story. Same thing, a guy in town, trombone player, but he breaks in on his ex after 15 years and his kid, you know, with the news. And, mm -hmm. And I think that's the direction they should go if they if they're going to redo it. And maybe it'd be, you know, a six hour limited series, go from midnight to to dawn or something like that. And, um, you know, we'll see. Right now, everything's shut down. But nobody knows yeah, what we're doing. Yeah, of course. Feature films are certainly practically dead, and and limited series are what's king. And the best work's going on in that right now too. I think so. That's it. I mean, streaming services have just changed the whole plane of everything with Netflix and Amazon, and it's all the ones in America with with it, Hulu and, and so many more. Yeah, they're all they're all competing and sort of throwing money at it. At some point, I think that will peak and drop off because you can't keep up with all these shows. I mean, right now people can't leave their house, so it it's a it's a perfect storm of, for streaming binging you know, anything and everything. But at some point, people actually go back to living in the world and you you won't want to watch, you know. Cer certainly, I think many seasons of a show will be more rare. They'll just do these, you know, eight or ten episode things. Yeah. What's it like being in 2020 and there's people like me and Tom who were just rabid fans of Miracle Mile and just want to talk about it and how many times tom have we recommended miracle mile to people over the years since we've known each other oh yeah so many times so many times yeah it's a, it's, uh, it's one of those it's one of those go-tos of we're talking we get talking with film with people and, and me and tom always say one of the first ones we mentioned miracle mile you've ever seen miracle mile there's no, one that you need to watch I, I am worried now that it's becoming i mean it's still an obscure cult film but like it's been this thing, yes, where where people just I have a film you don't know about and don't find out anything about it. That's what you tell your friends, right? <laughs> just watch, this. yeah, yeah. Watch it at four in the morning yeah. if you can, but don't don't read up on it. I you know some of the artwork on various things, including the Chadwick stuff. Don't look at this because you know, it'll give it away. Uh, and and usually before a screening, I'll say it here. I've said it a million times. They, you know, the film is sort of a fluffy 80s john hughes romantic comedy that gets less fluffy as it goes along mm -hmm. and you know that's sort of true it's very 80s you know could be more 80s if we used smoke and wet the streets and <laughs> and a few other things but you know it the mullets the red mullet that's <laughs> <laughs> on mayor. It's the only thing I would like to go back and change. I would like to CGI that into a better haircut. <laughs> That's great. What was it when you were putting it all together? I mean, there's some fabulous locations in it. What was the decision with the locations that you used? I wrote it for those locations. For those, it's, yeah. It is, I mean, have you guys been to LA? I've been, I've been once a few years ago, yeah. And if you ever do get the, well, now, very sadly, the, the museum, they just tore it down. The tar pits, of course, are going to be there. Mm -hmm. But 
they're you know they're wrecking Los Angeles, just a lot of great old places. And uh, but I mean, I wrote it for you know Wilshire for the Tar Pits, begins and ends at the Tar Pits, and I think it was a different idea of a diner, and we ended up with Johnny's, which is better, which is still there. It's just a closed down movie set now. And it, I don't know how it survived with all the changes in Los Angeles. The May Company, that sort of deco thing right across from Johnny's, is the new Academy uh, of Motion Pictures Museum and, you know, is preserved. Um, so only the gas station was, did we film somewhere else and you're not quite sure? Otherwise, everything is just, is really according to where it is mm -hmm. on, in geography. Because the diner on the Blu-ray, there's the reunion, isn't there, where you all go back into the diner. That's one of the great extras on there. That, I'm, you know, I'm still paying off my credit card on that because we could get in there for six hours. We couldn't even get, they don't even open it up um, for less than like $30,000 a day or something for, wow. for shoot. Even though the art direction in there, the, um, you know, the blue in, in orange stuff in there, we put that in there. We, we art directed it so it looks the way it does. It was really dark and dingy before. So the way they use it now as a set is, you know, we that was the Miracle Mile, uh, uh, Chris Harner, the production designer. We talk about that on the commentary, I think. And then Teo, here's something I learned during the, the commentary, my DP, Teo Vondesanti. The lights at Johnny's didn't work anymore. So we put in 5,000 bulbs, which the gaffer, John O, dipped this is I learned from Teo during the temperature, dipped in blue paint three times to get the right temperature, color temperature, and they're still <laughs> uh, going today. So, wow. Uh, oh. But yeah, we got into Johnny's for six hours, and we had, it was a love fest. We got, you know, almost all the supporting cast who were, were around and just did that thing. And there's 10 minutes or 10, 12 minutes on the Kino, an additional 25 minutes on the Arrow and others. And there's more, there's more footage. I mean, there's more stuff I'll put on the website. Uh, so The website's uh, going to be a must visit for everybody. Everybody's going to have to visit the website. Yeah, so sign up for the email thing there because, uh, you know, it's, it's just it's just me. I mean, I have some, a great person helping me ne negotiate uh, Squarespace and, like, mm -hmm. because I'm a Luddite. But it's just it's going to take another year to put everything up there and, there's 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 outtake clips of other stuff there too. Well, I'm, right now I'm just shooting them off the computer, and they're not that good. But you know they don't they don't really have to be. But there's you know it's, it's fun to see. There'll there'll be everything you ever wanted to know on there. Well, that's <laughs> it's, um, well I'm definitely going to keep visiting. I know you will as well, won't you, Tom? With that? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, one thing I found as well with rewatching Miracle Mile, and I've watched it into double figures now, and I rewatched it just a few nights ago. It's the tension of it. I was, I know, of course, what happens in it, but I'm, yeah. it's still so bloody tense as you're watching it, and it just <laughs> and it just ramps up as you know as the uh, as it gets closer uh, and closer I, to I the I end. I wish we had footage where we could do alternate versions, so it would be like roulette, like you're not, you know, there'd be slight changes. So when you watch it again, you're not sure. You know, that's what people should do with movies, I think. But, for, for, but you never know if you're going to make a movie that people want to watch 10 <laughs> times, you know. But, but if you could do that, uh, then you could go back and something could be slightly different and it would still end the same. Or, you know, there, there is the happy alternate ending on the Blu-rays, mm, too. You know? Yeah. Which is two seconds long of a, the diamonds, <laughs> but, uh, which nobody seems to like. I, I commissioned a friend of mine, Elisa Bello, the Go Go's original drummer, she's in the new documentary of Yo Yo's, uh, to do those diamonds. And it's just white light that coalesces and, you know, diamonds spin away. And that was the upbeat ending. But uh, John Daly, the head of Hemdale, actually said, oh, that's too upbeat. Let's cut it out. Let's let's rip their hearts out. That was the, the studio head. <laughs> and <laughs> usually the director's going, no, I want to go with the darker ending. This is the studio head. No, let's go darker. I'm glad he said that. That I do like the way that it ends. I've got to admit, I yeah, love the way that it ends. Yeah, you know, I, I like it as a curiosity. But and I, and actually, my the best print I have of the film that's at the Academy does have that diamond at the ending. But pretty much everybody who comes to see the movie when we have a screening in LA, they've already seen it, so they you know they want to see the the alternate thing anyway. But uh, I remember the first time that I watched it as well, and I was thinking. 
is it going to happen? He, he, get, he gets the phone call and is it real or was it a fake? And I remember thinking so long until you find out, you know, that it, it is, is going to happen. As you, as you were writing this, did you have, like, in your, in your mind how far you wanted to take it with the narrative yeah. bef- before the viewer went, oh, it is going to happen? Uh, yeah, and I, and, and I think I put, I'm right at the edge of frustrating you too much. I mean, e- even when they're, they're, t- they're finally together and then they're running back and he thinks he sees the helicopter pilot across the street. So, that, you know, that's a plot machination to separate them again. And then it turns out to not be him and then you, you have to get back together again. So that stuff really frustrates you. And they're actually in the outtakes, there's, we never filmed it, but there's Gersted, the crazy guy in the heliport, reacting to a bit that was in the script that um, would have been too much too. So the first missiles coming over before the, those three that actually do it before, before after the Tijuana one maybe. Anyway, the first missile came and landed about six blocks away. They're holding each other, but it was a dud. It's just steaming, you know, <laughs> down on Wilshire Boulevard, which I from research. It uh, was said that, you know, uh, two thirds of the Russian warheads wouldn't go off. They'd be defective. So, um, you know, that could happen, but that's too much. Then, it, then you're back to that thing of, I, am I dreaming? And, and I think it has probably the right level of frustration now. I, I remember back in those days as well, all the cold war, you know, you would got America and Russia, it was everywhere, wasn't it? Well, yeah, we're, you know, we were trained in school to yeah, get duck roll and cover and this is going to happen and get under your table and, and then take the cans of food. Oh, I do it. Survival biscuit tin. 1962. Oh, Very good year for survival biscuits. Survival biscuit tin. <laughs> yeah, that's civil defense. So we have some mammoth chunks around here too, but um, which you can see. In the, in the, that's more recent. Um, but yeah, and and I love to tell audiences it's much more likely to happen tonight than back then when we made the film, because you know when the Cold War was at high alert, everybody's you know really highly trained. They're doing the, these drills all the time. Now they still sort of go through the motions, but. All our warheads and all of Russia's are are pointed at each other. Mm-hmm. You get some disgruntled person, you know, you know. I mean, it's hard to you know for one person to, to do it. So there is a guy in a certain house with a, with white paint on it um, that can push that button, and you know, who knows? So um, if we'll I, see. If I'm ever out at gone four o'clock in the morning. And a public phone rings to me. I'm just, I'm just not going to answer it. That's it. There aren't too many phones anymore. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and I'd seen that. I'd seen a, a, a phone ringing before once, and I, I, I am trying to figure out where. I mean, it was mainly from nightmares. I think that I had where the idea came. But I did see Barbara Felden from Get Smart on a payphone at the Tar Pits once when I the first week I get, can't, got to Los Angeles. So maybe that influenced it somehow. That, that could be. Before we wrap this up, there's one thing that we haven't talked about, and I do want to briefly just to ask you a couple of things about it. And it's the Alfred Hitchcock Presents episode. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I hadn't seen that before as well, because that was based on a Roald Dahl story, which was big over here. Well, yeah, Roald Dahl. It's been filmed many times, mm-hmm. and the original was Peter Laurie, Steve McQueen. That was my first professional job after doing Tarzana and turning down about 30 features to direct. Um, and it was the fourth episode um, in a t- four-part TV movie, and then it turned into a TV series. And I was the student filmmaker, and the other three directors had gone over schedule, so there's a lot of pressure on me. But I pulled it off. I was very prepared. Yeah. I had Paul Chadwick storyboarded, and I did this stills, you know, block thing. And, yeah, John Houston, Kim Novak, Tippi Hedren, Melanie, we, we got mm-hmm. along swell on that one, Stephen Bauer, her husband from, from Scarface, and Danny De La Paz, who's who's uh, you know plays the the the, uh, the person R- Roger in the diner in, in Miracle Mile, um, but yeah, that turned into a TV show, and then soon thereafter, I did Charity, so yeah. that was sort of back to back on that. Oh, I got I do have to plug my book though. Do it. Go on. Okay. 
So I, you know, um, you know, what I've been doing lately, even though I'm putting my toe back into the waters trying to, to get things going in the limited series world, I, I went and got a degree in, in creative writing and, you know, I have, you know, stories in the best American short stories, et cetera. And I think if you liked Miracle Mile, um, you know, I don't know if you have a link, but there you can, it's on Amazon, but you can get it cheaper at University of Chicago Press. There, you can, if you go to my website, you'll see it prominently, this, this book up there. And I think you can get the, the ebook for like 10 bucks and it's 20% off with a, with a code too. If you contact me on there, I can, I can give you that code. Yeah. Well, I'll, and, I'll put know, a link to it into the great, show. Definitely. Great odd stories that, you know, that are intense about survival and redemption and, you know, short stories. So, you know, you're not going to have to slog through a novel <laughs> that, that was, what is it about writing that excites you still? You know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of burnt on writing. I've been doing it for so long and, and I'm taking a break from the fiction thing because I've mm. started some novels. Um, but I do want to break this big sort of ambitious, uh, limited series, which is about filmmakers and in, in LA and, and, uh, we'll, we'll see if there's a life for that. Um, and I don't know, just, I, I'm trying to learn how to play music. I'm going to start a band because I hear there's a shortage of them now and it's really easy to make a lot of money on Spotify. But <laughs> perhaps I was misinformed. Uh, there's some great Welsh bands. Isn't it like, what's that band? McCluskey that turned into something else? I don't know. Oh, I'm not the person to ask with Welsh music. <laughs> I've got an no. old man, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tom Jones. Tom that's Jones. About it. Yeah. <laughs> Tom Shirley, Jones, yeah. Shirley Bassey. Uh, then, then do I. Do you know where the the most pure speaking Welsh community is in the world? Where's that? Patagonia in Argentina. Of course, yes. Yeah, a friend of ours did some filming over there, and mm -hmm. he's fluent in Welsh. And uh, yeah, he was amazed when he went over there. Now, I, I am doing a documentary on Whammo, the uh, the toy company that that did uh, the Frisbee and the Hula Hoop and oh. just doing a short, short documentary on them, but we'll see. We're going to have to have you back on the, on the show, Steve. Wouldn't you? Hey, hey any, any time. Yeah. I'd love to. Wouldn't we, Tom? Of course we would. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. There's a lot more to chat about. I was supposed to, I was supposed to do this, you know, show in Manchester for the 30th anniversary of, uh, you know, Black Sunday. Two years ago, and then I had a psoas muscle injury. I couldn't fly. And then I had a ticket to get to Dublin next March, but they just canceled that flight. So I was going to come over to the UK and do go to Liverpool and, and uh, Dublin and Manchester and maybe uh, Wales. Uh, but that's not looking likely now. So I'd love, to, I'd love to get over there at some point if Arrow would want to bring me over. There we go. Well, we'll help to plug that definitely. When and when you do come over, we'll be here to greet you. Definitely. Thank you. Well, for the sake anyway. of the edit, Steve, thank you so much for joining us. I just, I want to spend, I want to spend some time in that room. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I got a lot of books, and uh, and you know, you saw my friends back there. Mm -hmm. that, uh, let's see, what else have I got? I got a theremin. <laughs> Oh my yes. <laughs> Oh, I love those. So yeah, I got a lot of weird stuff. That's what we and like. It's nice, it's nice being up here, you know, for the pandemic, but I I miss Los Angeles. I'd rather be in the smog and fires and traffic of Los Angeles. I'm out in the country. <laughs> Too dull and beautiful. So. Oh. Well, if you don't mind, once again, if you would get the clapperboard and to finish the show, how we begin, let, we may as well do it professionally, haven't we, to end the show. So thank you, Steve. Chaos late. <laughs>